today, and it's the second Sunday of Advent, and Advent has a twofold focus as we practice it today. One is that we are looking forward to and anticipating the celebration of the first Advent, the first coming of Jesus Christ to the earth 2,000 years ago. And then we're also looking forward to an advent that has not yet occurred, the second coming of Christ Jesus. And these first two Sundays of Advent, the Sunday of Hope and today the Sunday of Peace, the scripture passages look forward to a coming hope and a coming peace that will only be fully realized when Jesus comes back again. Now it's important to remember that while this hope and this fully developed peace won't occur until Jesus comes again, the beginning of that coming occurred in the first advent. That's why we sing Christ the Savior is come. God came 2,000 years ago. Christ's kingdom is coming today, and Christ's kingdom will come. We noticed as well last week Advent is a time of anticipating the impossible. A virgin giving birth. God taking up residence in human form and living with his human creation. We are looking forward to a day when nations won't make war anymore. When the weapons of war will be turned into weapons of food and nourishment, swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. God is our only hope for salvation. We live in a troubled world today. Too often we see a world around us filled with violence, we see wars being fought, and we hear even more rumors of war. Just this past week, I could give you a litany of examples of our peaceful world being disrupted. We had two Christmas parades in North Carolina canceled out of fear of violence arriving, arising from potential protests and counter-protests over involvement of certain Confederate heritage groups. In New York State, we had two threats of school violence that were thankfully thwarted so that it didn't continue the all-too-prevalent pattern of school violence. We had two shootings on military installations, one on the West Coast and then down in Florida this week. And so it goes on and on. We're longing for peace. Last week we observed that this longing is an innate human desire that human beings have had from the very beginning. And our only hope for peace is through Jesus Christ. But beyond the physical violence we see, violence thrown at one another verbally, in writing, in pictures, in voice. We see endless wars of words as political pundits on television, as political so-called leaders scream and yell at each other and at anyone who disagrees with them. And beyond this verbal violence, there are many who have just plain gotten exhausted by it. We're all searching for peace. 
But God has a plan for transformation and peace. We see in today's scripture that God is working to bring justice and right rule through a faithful remnant of God's people. We see in verse 1 of what Isaac and Isaiah read, out of the stump of David's family, some translations say, out of the stump of Jesse, who is David's father, will grow a shoot, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. You see, the people in Isaiah's day were very much where we find ourselves. Surrounded by violence, weary by violence. We don't know exactly when Isaiah, or when Isaiah wrote these words, but it was during a time most likely after the Assyrians had risen to power in the north. They had been allied for a while with the northern kingdom of Israel and were threatening to attack the southern kingdom, Judah and Jerusalem. Most likely the Assyrians had finally taken over and wiped out essentially the northern kingdom and dispersed all of those Jewish residents to other parts of the world if they weren't killed. And Isaiah is in the southern kingdom of Judah in the Jerusalem area prophesying of a potential coming peace. Today's passage is actually part of a longer section of scripture that began back in Isaiah chapter 9 with, if you're familiar with Handel's Messiah, a very familiar passage about the Prince of Peace coming and how there will be the government upon his shoulders and how he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty Father, Prince of Peace. How there is a birth coming, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And then Isaiah, in the intervening verses between that passage in chapter 9 and today's passage in the beginning of chapter 11, warns the people of God's coming judgment. First of all, he warns Judah, the southern kingdom. He says, you are proud, you are abusing the poor, you are oppressing those who have less power than you do, and you're going to pay a price. The Assyrians may attack, of course, as it turns out, ultimately it was the Babylonians that came and destroyed about 150 years later the southern kingdom. The Assyrians, who were the ascendant world power at the time, Isaiah had a message for them as well, said, you too are proud. You too are, I have the image of the king of Assyria, Damascus, strutting around saying, look how good I am. My mighty armies taking over the world. I don't need any gods. And God says, you're going to be struck and down. Your arrogance and your pride will destroy you. But there will be a remnant. There will be a group of God's people who are faithful. And from the root of God's people who are faithful, there will spring from David's family, from Jesse's family, what appear, from what appears to be a dead stump, there will spring new life. A shoot, a beginning. And we know that that ruler will rule with a justice and a righteousness and a fairness that the world has never seen before. For the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord will be on this new ruler coming from the stump of Jesse and David's family. He will delight, Isaiah says, in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance, nor make a decision based on hearsay. This ruler won't be like other rulers. He will look beyond appearances. 
He won't favor the wealthy in their fine clothes, in their fine attire and carriage. He will bring justice to the poor, righteousness and fairness to the meek, to the lowly. There's debate among scholars as to who perhaps Isaiah may have been talking about because it's important to understand that Isaiah, like all Old Testament prophets, frequently has two parts to their message. There is a part that is addressed to their immediate audience, what I like to call forth telling bringing forth God's word to the people who actually hear it or read it first. And then there is foretelling, which is what we often think of prophecy as, as predicting the future. And sometimes the two blend, as this message of Isaiah, that is foretelling to the residents in Jerusalem and all of Judea, saying, if you don't, bring your pride under control, you're going to pay a penalty of judgment from God. But he's also foretelling the coming of a king like the world has never seen. And of course we know that king to be King Jesus, God's Messiah, God's chosen one. But interestingly enough, even for us, there is an element of foretelling as well as foretelling. Because if we judge the coming of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, the coming of God's Messiah first of all, if we judge it by the standard that this text says, that being full justice to the poor, fair decisions for the exploited, to the extent that all creation, all of nature, will put aside suspicion and fear. Think back to the text that we read earlier. In the day of this new ruler, this godly ruler invested by the spirit of God and the spirit of knowledge, the wolf and the lamb will live together. As we visualize on the screen, many works of art have sought to capture this passage of the wolf and lamb together, the leopard lying down with the baby goat, the calf and the yearling safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them. Just a quick aside, I'm fascinated by this reference to a little child leading them in connection with Jesus coming, because what did Jesus say? Suffer the little children to come unto me, unless you be like a little child. Unless you come to me with childlike faith, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And Isaiah talks about the child able to lay down with snakes, put their hand on the cobra, put their hand in the snake pit and not be bitten. For in this day, this ultimate forecoming time of peace, nearly unimaginable peace, among nature, the prey and the predator will lie down peacefully together. But beyond simply this metaphorical reference, and I believe Isaiah is talking both literally as well as metaphorically, there will come a time when God's creation will be put back where God intended and the Eden-like imagery that we have of every creature living in peace together will come, literally. But Isaiah is also speaking, I believe, metaphorically. 
saying that as God's natural creation, as natural prey and predator put aside their differences, so too will the human creation put aside suspicion and fear. Think back to last week when we examined this concept of Isaiah seeing God's Word. Here Isaiah is seeing ultimate peace. Natural suspicions, natural fears, natural hatred and enmity set aside in the natural kingdom as well as the human kingdom. For as Isaiah alludes to in talking about this Messiah and righteous ruler delighting in obeying the Lord and giving justice to the poor and making fair decisions for the oppressed, we live in a day of many human predators. Sexual abusers attacking their victims. Murderers killing and assaulting victims. Wars being fought. The rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer oftentimes through unjust laws or unjust practices. Business persons in power cheating those who have to come to them. We live in a world of human predators and human prey. But Isaiah is looking forward to a day when all of that will be wiped out and we will come together in peace. I started mentioning, started this sermon by mentioning our non-physical violence. Imagine the day that Isaiah is talking about when knowledge of God fills the earth, that nothing will hurt or destroy in God's holy mountain. For all of us will know God intimately, and the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. And this new Messiah, Jesus Christ, on the throne will be a beacon to all peoples, not just the Jews, bringing God's salvation to everyone. Imagine the 21st century version of Isaiah's vision, as you see represented perhaps on this screen. Think about when we put aside our personal suspicions, our personal fears, trusting God to bring us together. Republican and Democrat and Independent able to sit at the same table and be civil to one another. Liberals and conservatives and moderates and any other attives you want to come up with able to respect one another, to see one another as God's creation, created in God's image for whom Jesus came to live and to die. Black, brown, white, all races being valued by one another and not by the color of their skin. Native born and immigrant and refugee, all working together. God's people coming together regardless of denomination, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, and beyond God's people, the Christians, we respect other faiths, Muslim, Buddhist, those who question having any faith, the agnostics, and even those who claim to have no faith, and call themselves atheists. Men and women setting aside sexism and coming together. That's the day that Isaiah is foretelling, but he's also forthtelling. For it's not for us to simply sit back on our heels or our backsides and say, someday, 
Jesus will come and make it all right. No, we as God's people have responsibility to do our part. Let us leave this place today and prayerfully say, Lord, show me where in this list of words in a word cloud, maybe I have a little bit of fear. Who doesn't look, think, act, or behave the way I do? And maybe I'm afraid of them or wary of them. Help me to recognize that, Lord, and then show me how you wish for me to feel. We face a challenge of reaching our community. Many people say the church is dead. We're in a post-church, post-Christian day where all church attendance and communities are in decline. And in many respects, that's true. But God has a plan. I can also say that Trinity has a special place. Trinity in our congregation is nowhere near perfect in coming together regardless of our race, our political views, our theological views, but we make some special efforts to do it. Trinity is unique in that frequently we can express our views without fear of judgment and attack. There's a world out there that's weary from all of the garbage that we see on social media and television. Weary of the constant attacks so we can bring peace to the world around us. And it can start with us. Lord, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me with me putting down my spiteful tongue, with me remembering I have two ears and one mouth so I should listen to other people's stories. And most of all, remember that God loves me, God loves you, God loves every single person that we will see today, throughout the rest of the week, or the rest of our lives. And God calls us to love each one of them the same as he does. Let us pray. Loving God. this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.